In this video, we will use Hamilton's principle to derive the equations of motion for a tapered beam sitting on an elastic foundation. This will also give you a chance to practice your integration by parts a little bit more. So as shown in the diagram, we have a tapered beam that is simply supported on both ends, and this beam is sitting on an elastic foundation. Let's give it some axes. The x-axis will be in the axial direction of the beam, and the z-axis will run transverse, and we have the displacement coordinate w in that direction. The length of the beam is l, and because of the tapered nature of the beam, in this case, it's not a uniform beam, but instead, ei is a function of x, and also the mass per unit length is a function of x. And then this elastic foundation can be assumed to have a stiffness constant of beta. This behaves more or less like a discrete spring of stiffness k, except in this case, beta is a stiffness per unit length. And we'll have to integrate along the length of the beam to get the total stiffness contribution. So, as usual, we start off by writing Hamilton's principle. Hamilton's principle states that the integral from t1 to t2 of the variation of the Lagrangian is zero. So, the variation of the kinetic energy minus the variation of the strain energy plus the variation of the external work is equal to zero. And since there's no externally applied load in this problem, the variation of the external work must be zero. That's number one. All right, so we can write the strain energy of the beam U, and I'm going to try to preserve the colors. We'll do this in blue. That U is equal to one half the integral from zero to L of ei of x w comma x x squared dx. Remember that since ei is a function of x, we cannot take it outside of the integral like we have in other problems. Now we've got to add to this the strain energy contribution from this elastic foundation, and that is equal to one half the integral from zero to l, then it's just like the energy stored by a spring. So beta times w squared dx. So this term is very much like one half kx squared that we would get for a discrete spring. The only difference is that beta is a stiffness per unit length, and so we need to integrate the stiffness along the length of the beam. Okay, taking the variation of u, this gives del u is equal to the integral from zero to l of ei of x, and then the two cancels the half, w comma xx, del w comma xx, dx plus the contribution from the spring. And that is the integral from zero to L of beta. Again, the two cancels the half and we're left with W del W dx. And similarly, we can write the kinetic energy of the system. T is equal to, it's just one half the integral from zero to L of M W dot squared dx. And I guess I should mention that M is a function of X. I've dropped the X dependency just for shorthand. But don't forget, it is a function of x, and therefore it cannot be taken outside of the integral. Then we can take the variation of the kinetic energy. Del T is equal to integral from 0 to L, M. Again, the 2 cancels the half, and we're left with W dot, del W dot, dx. And let's give these some numbers, 2 and 3. So because this is lengthy, when substituting into Hamilton's principle, I'm going to do it part by part. So I'm going to start off by taking the integral from t1 to t2 of del u dt. Let's turn the page. So the integral from t1 to t2 of del u dt is equal to the integral from t1 to t2 of, and then everything I had on the previous page, close brackets dt. Now what do we need to do to proceed? We need to integrate this term by parts twice because we want to remove the derivative from the del w or the del w comma xx, and in doing so, we want to add the derivative to this first part of the integrand. So the first thing we do is we take exactly this and remove one of the derivatives from del w comma xx, and that will be the first boundary term. So again, the integral from t1 to t2, and just the boundary term, that's ei w comma xx del w comma x. I've dropped this x dependency here just for shorthand, but the important thing to notice is what I did is I just took a derivative of this part here. And this is going to be evaluated at the boundaries 0 and L. Now we flip the sign minus, again, the integral from 0 to L, 
And now we take this part and we add a derivative to it. So let me write it out. E i w comma x x. Now we want to take the derivative of that. So brackets comma x. And to be clear, since e i and w are a function of x, we would need to differentiate this using the product rule. I'm just going to leave it in this form for now. And that multiplies d w comma x. So again, to integrate by parts, we take this integrand, we remove one of the derivatives from the del w, that's why we only have one over here, and then that becomes the boundary term, and then we subtract the integral where we add the derivative to the first part of the integrand. So what we've effectively done is we've taken this derivative and we've shifted it like that. Uh, we're missing a dx and then the rest of it plus integral 0 to L of beta W del W dx dt. Okay, so what do we need to do next? We still have a derivative here on the del W comma x. So we need to integrate this by parts a second time. All right, so what do we have? This is equal to, well, it's just the first part. That doesn't change. Integral from T1 to T2 of the first boundary term minus, and again, it's all of this, except that we remove one of the derivatives from del w comma x. So this gives us minus e i w comma x x comma x del w. And that's evaluated at 0 and L. And then what do we do? We flip the sign. It becomes a plus the integral from 0 to L. And we're going to take this part and add a derivative here. So e i w comma x x comma x x added a second derivative. And that's times del w. But since this also multiplies del w, I'm going to take that out as a common factor and put plus beta w all times del w dx. And then all of this is going to be integrated over time, dt. Okay, so just once again, by integrating by parts, what I did is I took this integrand, I used it as a boundary term, having removed one of the x's from the del w comma x. That's why there are no x's here. And then what I do is I take this boundary term and I shift the derivative here. Okay, so once again, what we've done is we've taken this derivative and we've shifted it to the first part of the integrand. And then I'm just going to regroup this to write this in a slightly more convenient form. The integral from t1 to t2 of del u dt is equal to integral t1 to t2 of the integral from 0 to L of e i w comma x x comma x x plus beta w and all of this has got to be multiplied by del w and dx plus and then my boundary terms so the e i w comma x x del w comma x that's this term here minus this boundary term here and what am i missing close brackets and a dt so that is the variation of the potential energy of the system and it's ready to be plugged into hamilton's principle and so let's put an orange box around that. We're going to use that later. And what number are we up to? Four, I believe. All right, so next we'll have a look at the kinetic energy. And let's integrate the variation of the kinetic energy between times t1 and t2. So the integral from t1 to t2 of del t dt is equal to, and we'll preserve the green color coding for kinetic energy, the integral from t1 to t2 and then from the previous page, equation three, we just substitute that in here and we need a dt. And what do we need to do? Well, since there's a derivative on the del w, we need to integrate by parts. But what we need to do since it's a time derivative is we need to switch the order of our integrals. And this we can do quite easily. This is just equal to the integral from zero to L of the integral from t1 to t2 of m w dot del w dot dt now, and then dx. Remember the idea of integration by parts is we would like to remove the derivative from the del w dot and put the derivative on this part of the integrand. So that is equal to the integral from zero to L of the boundary term. Remember we take this and we just remove the dot from the del w dot. So m w dot del w without the derivative from t1 to t2. And the reason that del w is zero at both t1 and t2 is that this goes back to the definition of Hamilton's principle. In case you've forgotten, there's a link to the video above. 
But the idea behind Hamilton's principle is that we assume that the state of the system is known at time t1 and at time t2. Therefore, the variation of w is zero, since it's known. Okay, and then what do we do? Minus sign, and now we move the dot from the del w dot to the w dot. So this is equal to the integral from t1 to t2 of mw double dot now, del w dt. And then all of this needs a dx. Okay, so I can rewrite it, ignoring the boundary term, which is zero, as the integral from t1 to t2 of del t dt, this is equal to, and now I can switch the order of integration again. So the integral from t1 to t2 of, well, the negative sign can come outside of the integral, of the integral from zero to L of m w double dot del w dx dt. Okay, and let's put a yellow box around this result because we're gonna use this in a little while and give it a number, number five. Okay, so now we have all the ingredients we need to put this together. We're gonna to use equation five from this page and equation four from the previous page. And we're gonna substitute both of those into Hamilton's principle. So the reduced form of Hamilton's principle in the absence of external work is the integral from t1 to t2 of del t minus del u, dt is zero. Plugging in equation five and equation four, we get the integral from t1 to t2, and then this is just substitution. Negative integral from zero to L of m w double dot del w dx, and then a minus sign, the minus comes from here, and then from equation four. Integral from zero to L of e i w comma x x comma x x plus beta w uh, close brackets del w dx. And now we need to add the two boundary terms. First boundary term and the second one has a negative sign. And then all we're missing is close brackets dt. And by Hamilton's principle, this is all equal to zero. All right, so all that's left to do is we now play this game where in order for this to be satisfied, that the part under the integral needs to go to zero on its own, and so do each of the boundary terms. Each of these need to be zero on their own. Okay, so separately, let's first look at the integral. The integral from t1 to t2 of the integral from zero to L of, now there's a minus sign here and here, so I can just take that out, minus, and then the rest of the stuff under the integral. E i w comma x x comma x x plus beta w, and then from the kinetic energy plus m w double dot. And the reason for the plus sign is I've taken the minus outside. Uh, close brackets, del w dx, and I'm missing a dt, and all of that is equal to zero. Now we call on the fundamental lemma of the calculus of variations, and that is the fact that del w is arbitrary means that everything multiplying del w needs to be zero at all points along the integral. In other words, what we refer to mathematically as this inner product must be zero. And so that means that all of this part under the integral sign that multiplies the del w must be zero. So writing that out gives us the equation of motion that is e i of x w comma x x comma x x plus beta w plus m w double dot is equal to zero. Put a big red box around it. This is our equation of motion for the tapered beam on an elastic foundation and we'll number it six. Okay, so we proceed much in the same way to figure out our boundary conditions by setting, first of all, this boundary condition to zero, and then setting the second boundary condition to zero. So considering the first boundary condition, we get that ei w comma x x del w comma x at zero and l is equal to zero. Since w comma x is unknown, Therefore, the variation on the slope, del w comma x, is arbitrary at both the boundaries, which means that what is multiplying that has got to be zero at each boundary. So because this is arbitrary, therefore e i w comma x x at zero and at l must be zero. I can divide both sides by e i and I get w comma x x, which is the curvature of the beam, at zero and at l is equal to zero.
So this implies the first set of boundary conditions are at x equals 0, w comma x, x is 0. And similarly, at x equal to l, w comma x, x is also 0. These two boundary conditions are known as natural boundary conditions. I don't really like the term, but the reason they're called natural is because these conditions naturally come out of the derivation. I think a better term for this is forced boundary conditions. Because of the pin joints at each end, the beam cannot support a moment at either end, and so therefore it's a free edge in that sense, and therefore the curvature is zero. Okay, and for the second boundary condition, we get e i w comma x x comma x del w at zero and at l is equal to zero. Now the reason that del w is equal to zero at both zero and l is because of the geometric boundary conditions there, and that is we know it's simply supported, so the beam is pinned at both ends, and therefore both ends cannot displace at all. So because of the geometric boundary conditions, the variation of w is zero at both ends. So this gives rise to the boundary condition at x equals zero, w is equal to zero, and similarly at x equal to l, w is also equal to zero. And these, as I mentioned, are geometric boundary conditions. And that's it, we're done. Let's give these numbers, seven and eight, and big red boxes around it, and we're done. Those are the boundary conditions. Okay, so we're done. So before we go, let's summarize this quickly and take it from the top and run through this really quickly so it flows. We want to define the equations of motion and boundary conditions for a tapered beam on an elastic foundation. The boundary conditions is that it's simply supported at each end. We recognize we need to use Hamilton's principle, and in order to do that, we need the variation of the kinetic and potential energies. So I discussed how to find the variation of the potential and the kinetic energy. We then integrated each of them between T1 and T2 and simplified it. Then we substituted into Hamilton's principle. We grouped everything that was under the integral sign together. And we made the point that everything under the integral sign has to go to zero on its own, as do each of the boundary terms have to go to zero on their own. By setting each of those components equal to zero, we arrived at the equations of motion and separately the boundary conditions. As it turns out, in this case, the boundary conditions could probably have been solved by inspection, but this is good practice for more difficult problems you're going to see down the line that involve mixed boundary conditions. This will be a good working recipe for how to tackle those. Anyway, that's all I wanted to say about this video. I hope you have found something useful in it. If you have, please go ahead and hit those like buttons. It really helps others like you get to see it. If you would like to be notified of future video releases, please hit the subscribe button and click the bell icon. If you have any questions, comments, criticisms for me, I'd love to hear from you in the comments section below. Remember, as always, the notes for this and all other videos are available from the link provided in the description below. Thank you very much for watching, and I will catch up with you in the next video.